Hello. Let's see. Uh, I can't remember what we're going to talk about today. Oh, <laughs> we're going to talk about memory decay. <laughs> so memory decay uh, refers to the fact that was kind of a bad joke when it <laughs> uh, refers to the fact that memory tends to fade with time. Okay, we you know the longer uh, it's been uh, since we learned something or experienced an event the less likely we are to be able to reconstruct it and remember a lot about it. So that's the phenomenon of memory decay. Now, the critical question here is whether the decay of memory over time is an automatic, inevitable kind of thing, or can we gain control over it? Do uh, Does our memory mechanisms... Uh, uh, allow us to control the rate of memory decline, which would be kind of cool, right, if that were the case. All right. Well, if we make out of the first slide, this illustrates a, a very uh, common procedure used to study memory, both in human subjects and uh, in non-human subjects. Uh, if you're interested in the neuroscience of memory, this particular slide was taken from an experiment with human participants. Uh, the strategy for this memory task this is a working memory task, a short-term memory task, if you will, where you present a sample stimulus to, on the screen, or it's a series of uh, gray and black uh, <clears throat> pattern boxes. And then there is a delay, which is what makes this a memory task. And then uh, the participants are given a choice test of two different stimuli, one of which matches the sample on that trial and the other of which does not. So it takes a little bit of figuring out which is the matching stimulus in this particular case. I let you worry about worry about that. And that's the matching to sample task. Now this is also studied with uh, pigeons, pigeons, lots of pigeon experiments, but you can do this experiment with any, uh, any, at type of uh, any species of animal, any type of stimulus you can have matching the sample, olfactory cues, spatial cues, uh, uh, auditory stimuli, and so forth and so on. The next slide shows you uh, the typical outcome of a matching to sample uh, experiment done with pigeons. Uh, the pigeons who are trained up to do this matching the sample uh, task uh, with colors, I believe, with a sample and choice stimuli. And they're performed at the end of training. And these particular birds had lots and lots of uh, training experience. They run a bunch of different experiments. Uh, in this particular experiment, uh, what the investigator was Doug Grant, who went, then went to the University of Alberta. This is These are Canadian data, folks. <laughs> anyway, I did this test series in which he presented the sample stimulus and then varied the delay interval, and the delay interval was varied between zero and 60 seconds before he presented the choice stimulus to see how the delay affected the choice performance. And you got what uh, is typical memory loss decay kind of uh, data. And the longer the delay interval, the worse the performance. Uh, and the, the various lines here represent uh, uh, different uh, conditions uh, that involve the, the duration of the sample stimulus. But regardless of what the duration of sample stimulus was, the longer you, the delay uh, uh, it was imposed before the choice alternatives, the worse the performance. 50% represents chance performance in this case. And so this seems to suggest perhaps memory decay is inevitable. <laughs> Well, the next experiment points us in a different direction. This, the next experiment, whose data are shown in the next slide, <clears throat> these are data collected in New Zealand, <laughs> first experiment in Canada, and now we're in New Zealand. We travel the world in uh, studies of conditioning and learning. So here there were three, three groups of uh, pigeons that are shown here, and they were trained with different delays between the sample stimulus and the choice alternative during the training phase. And once they all uh, achieved about 90% accuracy, then they were given this test series where the delay was varied from zero to 10 seconds. 
And if you look at the top left uh, data, uh, for those birds, the training involved a zero interval between the sample and the choice stimuli during the training trials. And uh, then when you in, uh, tested them with various delays, you get the typical memory decay function like we saw in the previous graph. Check the next one over on the right. These guys were trained with a four second delay and uh, uh, they don't show a standard decay function. In fact, the, fun the uh, memory function is much more flat and it's entirely flat in the bottom graph where the pigeons were trained with a six, six second uh, sample to a choice uh, kind of interval. So what does this mean? I, I, this is some of my favorite data because they, they're, these results are spectacular. What they tell you is that if you know that you're gonna have to remember, then you remember a lot better. If you're trained to remember, your memory actually gets better. <laughs> so memory loss is not inevitable. It's not automatic. It just happens if you don't much care. Uh, but if you're, tr you can be actually trained to remember. And if you're trained to remember, then you don't show the typical kind of uh, uh, memory decay function. You can also be trained, so uh, the, here the training involved uh, the, the delay between the sample and the choice alternatives uh, uh, during the training phase. Uh, so the longer the delay, the delay was on each of those training trials, the better the pigeons uh, uh, managed to remember things and the more shallow their memory decay function was. So uh, here, memory, uh, uh, the amount of memory you were trained on was constant across a given uh, uh, procedure. But it turns out you can also turn memory on and off. <laughs> and uh, that seems kind of unusual. Well, <laughs> that conclusion comes from uh, experiments that are called directed forgetting experiments. And directed, the directed forgetting paradigm was uh, first developed in studies of memory with human participants uh, uh, in which uh, human participants were given a list of things to remember. And after each item, they either got the letter R <laughs> which told them, hey, you're going to be tested on this item, so you better remember it. Or they got the letter F, which told them, you're going to forget this item, you're not going to be tested on it. And so that's how training proceeded. So some items were followed by R, remember cues, and other items were followed by forget cues. And then on the critical uh, test phase of the experiment, uh, the subjects were shown an item, given a forget cue, but now we, we check to see if they in fact forgot. <laughs> uh, or, and uh, so uh, during the test phase, uh, everybody was tested whether they got remember cues on every stimulus was tested, whether it was followed by a remember cue or a forget cue. So on the next slide shows you a version of the directed forgetting task uh, that was done in pigeons, pigeon matching the sample. And uh, uh, the sample stimulus appears in the middle of the pecking uh, key. This is also an experiment that was done in New Zealand. <laughs> New Zealand is big on memory experiments. And uh, uh, the remember cue was a high pitch sound. And then there was a delay and uh, subjects were tested for it. Uh, on a forget trials, the sample stimulus appeared. They got a forget cue, a low pitch tone, and then they weren't tested on it. But during at the end of the experiment, we checked to see if the forget cue in fact promoted forgetting, and whereas the remember cue promoted remembering. So the results of the test trial at the end of the experiment are shown in the next slide for two pigeons, EZ2 and T19. And you can see the test results for uh, trials when the R, remember, Q is presented. 
and the test results for when the forget queue is uh, presented. And uh, what's obvious here is that uh, performance was much more accurate on remember queue trials than it was on forget queue trials. So this shows that memory can be brought under stimulus control. It shows that memory can be turned on and off. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, the loss of memory or memory decay with time is not inevitable. It's not automatic, but it can be actually controlled which reminds me of what is the most frequently asked question that I get from students uh, when I present some material and uh, I want to check to be sure that everybody understood it <laughs> like we might do at the end of this video. I take some time and I invite questions from the class. <laughs> and you know what's the most frequently asked question that students ask? Is this going to be on the test? <laughs> Is this going to be on the test? Why are students asking them? Or what's this process of asking that question? Well, students are trying to decide whether to give themselves a remember cue after the information or a forget cue. <laughs> if it's going to be on a test, you know you're going to have to remember it. And if you get that remember cue instruction, then you process the information differently and you're much more likely to remember it when you're tested on it. If it's not going <laughs> to, I hate to think about all the things I've talked about over the years with students that were not on the test. And uh, some of it they forgot. Well, that's one reason I try to be kind of outrageous and entertaining <laughs> in some class presentations so as to promote remembering even if it's not on the test. So whether this material will or will not be on the test, I hope you will remember it. And I hope you will give up the common uh, characterization of memory decay as kind of an inevitable automatic kind of thing. It's not. You can gain control over your memory. So thanks very much. And I hope I'll remember to come back for the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>